But going back to that first day on operation, I arrived in, Craig said, gear up guys, We've got orders to go out and check out that ambush that we and elements of the um, infantry guys had put in last night. So we, off we went, we drove out. Now, this is deep down inside me. I was, I was in hospital for three months suffering this awful depression and anxiety and, and they said it was PTSD and I couldn't remember anything traumatic that had happened. And, and, um, and so I had a weekend where I had to, had to go to Adelaide to fulfill a commitment. I flew down to Adelaide and I contacted Craig and I said, Craig, can you tell me anything that you remember that might have been so traumatic that I'd be still living with it? Because I can't remember. To me, it was all, you know, you guys were all full of fun and joy. He said, you don't remember the first day we went out? And I said, no. And he said, we went out there, you saw your first dead body. And I said, oh. no, I don't remember. Really? And he said, you saw your first dead body. He said, don't you, don't you recall? And we didn't have time to do anything. And the engineers were called in to give him an engineer's burial, which is to place the plastic explosive on the bodies and and I just I just said no and it's funny you know it seems to be the way the, the human brain works 24 hours later I remembered it vividly every single part of leaving Firebase Julia going out through the it was as dry as anything full of dust and everything and I can remember going uh, through the paddy fields and eventually to the edge of the jungle uh, where this uh, ambush was, was taken, had taken place and seeing the dead bodies and even, even writing home and saying, it's funny, uh, peculiar funny, that this, this dead body who was obviously a thriving human being 24 hours before, looked like one of the dead animals that had been hit by a car or a train that we often saw at home. There was no, just looked like, you know, a lifeless form. And he must have been quite skinny because there was, there's no meat on his body and he didn't smell yet. Um, the blood had dried up already because of the heat. And it was, it, 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 to me now, even today, it was, it was so, uh, it, it's so indelible and so, but so clear. And, and I couldn't remember that. And it was 25 years. It was 2001 when I was trying to think of this. So it was 30 years. Right up until 2000, oh, probably about 1993 or 4, I thought everything was okay. But in hindsight, nothing was okay for a long, long time, you know. There were, there were uh, irregular outbursts of anger and even violence sometimes. I just couldn't stand what it was going on and I'd punch a hole in the wall or something like that. From time to time I'd binge drink and uh, oh, there's a whole lot of stuff. <clears throat> and eventually I tried to commit suicide in 2001. And uh, two of my mates grabbed me and they'd been watching this, this train wreck hurtling down the track with a huge mountain in front of it and nowhere to go, no tunnel. And they grabbed me, Brian was one, and uh, Mick Earnshaw, another mate from CAV, was the other. And, they, and Mick had actually done uh, a, a cohort course for po post-traumatic stress disorder at Palm Beach Corumban. And so um, they, they grabbed me and uh, uh, they, they 
dropped into my local doctor and said we need a referral for him to go down there because this has happened blah 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 and I was I was like I was like I was made out of soft rubber I was, you know and uh, they took me into uh, Palm Beach Corumban Hospital and I was there for six weeks in fetal position couldn't move couldn't move and uh, I just split up from uh, from my partner who spent a lot of time trying to run away from me and I understand now why because she was smart <laughs> and uh, but every time she walked away it was like you know my whole world was crashing down around me and uh, the last time was the last was the last uh, straw and that's when I, I said that's it I can't can't deal with this this pain and anymore it was like this sort of like this stainless steel ball with very sharp hooks on it spinning around inside me. It was the most horrible feeling. And um, so they took me into the hospital and talked to psychiatrists and psychologists and, you know, and eventually um, one of them said, I'd like you to see a colleague of mine. Um, he specialises in war-related post-traumatic stress disorder and I said oh look I'm not suffering from that so it's, it's all about this bloody woman that's run away uh, this humor me I, th I thought that was a fantastic statement coming from because that's what you normally do with a, somebody insane <laughs> so I went along to this specialist and funnily enough I had already been diagnosed but I didn't believe the diagnosis I've been diagnosed in in Sydney with PTSD but I didn't be believe it because it didn't I didn't remember anything traumatic you know just oh, a little firefight here and a little bit there but it was what it was was living in a war zone or living in living in fear that at any minute you could die 24 7 for more than three months mm. that's it that's all it takes that's a lot. three months and you're likely to have PTSD for the rest of your life, six months you will. They're still sending our diggers away for more than six months at a time and then not realising that it's, a, it's cumulative. So they, six months, three months off, six months, three months off, and then they're building, and then they're wondering why they're doing so badly. So six weeks in this fetal position and then I speak to this guy and he said, you have, at that time, there were 19 indicators. He said, you have 18 of the 19 indicators of severe post-traumatic stress disorder. And the only one you don't really have is binge drinking. And, and I said, that's because I stopped it. And I, and I couldn't look after my kids if I was drunk. And he said, well, that's one thing we don't have to worry about too much, isn't it? And so now, whenever I start to feel stressed, I stop drinking. I don't have anything to drink. I, I just stop. Uh, I regularly have two or three coffees a day. I stop drinking coffee. I don't build anything towards the stress. I try desperately to get the right amount of sleep. And then I got a... A, a psychologist who is, uh, um, uh, is she's she's fantastic. She takes no prisoners, you know. Don't bullshit me, you know that sort of thing. She's heard everyone's stories, and listened to them, and, and and she's very very well educated and highly intelligent. Um, so I can't fool her. And the most important thing when you go along to a psychiatrist or a psychologist is to lay yourself bare and just say it all and and don't bullshit and don't try to outsmart them because you won't and if you do you're actually trying to you're really outsmarting yourself and you won't get the help you need if you don't do that if you if you don't lay yourself just bare 
and let it all out so you can find out what it is and how it is causing you the sort of grief that you're wearing. But the one thing is common is that it was probably more important in our character makeup than any other single event. And if that is so, if that is important, then one of the great reasons that Vietnam veterans have suffered so long, and probably will till they, till they die, was that for so many years, we've been told that the most important thing that ever happened in our lives was a waste of time. So if you put that on one side of a scale and then you put the rest of your life on the other side of the scale, you know that this weighs so heavily on you and it's a waste of time. What's the other side of your scale? Your self-esteem has got to be shot, surely. <laughs>